Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to foster, stimulate, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free public programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our film committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Slapstick Divas, the Women of Silent Comedy, featuring author Steve Massa. The event will be moderated by the chair of our film committee, Gary Shapiro. Slapstick Divas can be purchased from our preferred independent bookseller, Books on Call, uh, via the link we'll be sharing in the chat during the event. Following the discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Gary and Steve. Please enjoy the program. Thank you, Nadine. Steve Massa is author of Lame Brains and Lunatics, The Good, the Bad, and the Forgotten of Silent Comedy. Another of his books, Marcel Perez, The International Mirthmaker. He's organized and curated comedy film programs at the MoMA, Library of Congress, Museum of the Moving Image, the Smithsonian, and many other places. He um, consults with um, various film archives, including Cineteca de Bologna, the Royal Belgian Cinematheque, and others. He has a series that he co-hosts with Ben Modell, the silent film accompanist, called Silent Comedy Watch Party on a Sundays. It's very popular and it's um, recommended um, to check it out um, if, if you haven't heard of it, um, heard of it yet. Steve Massa has provided essays and commentary tracks to many comedy DVD and Blu-ray collections, including Roscoe Arbuckle, um, Harry Langdon, Lost and Found, Becoming Charlie Chase, and a King video, Kino video is Buster Keaton. Um, I want to thank Steve for coming and joining us as our um, as our special guest today. Steve, welcome. Well, thanks, Gary. Thanks for the invite. It's fantastic. Good. So, Steve, where did you grow up, and how did you come to become interested in silent film? Uh, okay. Well, I grew up. Um, in a town, Mansfield, Ohio, which is sort of in the middle of Ohio. And uh, since I'm in my, I'm, I'm uh, technically, I'm officially a senior now. So I'm 65 years old. So I was born in 1955. And uh, the way that I found silent films, silent comedy films was on television. And what they did in the late fifties is they took uh, they took these silent shorts and they kind of adapted them for kids. They, they would take a short, they would take out all the intertitles, they cut them down to like uh, 10 minutes and they put in funny music and uh, sometimes it was supposed to be funny narration, but it was usually not that funny. But they, they, they sort of made live action cartoons out of them. And that's how I first saw silent comedies and I got really hooked on them. You know, I thought they were great. I was watching these programs every day on television. Uh, at the same time, I was watching Laurel and Hardy. I was watching The Three Stooges. And, and of course, our gang, The Little Rascals. I was watching those sound shorts as well. So they were all kind of, you know, the same thing. And I would recognize people that were in the silent films who were also in the sound films. You know, so I started recognizing people. So that, that was my start. That's how I sort of got hooked on them. Yeah. Um, tell me, uh, the book Slapstick Divas, which I have here, um, um, and tell me, why did you write this book? 
I, you, I, I saw a line and it said your love for Alice Howell and Gail Henry and asking why they weren't better known. Yeah. Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, that's actually kind of the start. Um, I wrote an article for uh, the um, Portanone Silent Film Festival used to have a magazine called Griffithiana. And I wrote an article for them uh, about Gail Henry and Alice Howe, who are two of my favorite silent comedians. Uh, and in doing all the research on these women, I found that there were tons of women and none of them were getting the kind of respect that they deserved. I would see their films and the films are still funny. So it wasn't just Alice Howe and Gail Henry. It was Faye Tincher. It was, you know, Marie Dressler, of course, who, whose name is well known. But there were tons of, of women who were very popular, you know, in the teens and in the 20s. But they've been really overlooked. And, you know, I thought it was unfair that everybody was talking about Chaplin and Keaton and Harold Lloyd and Laurel and Hardy. You know, I, I felt it was something of a boys club. Uh, and, and they were looking for their films. They were looking for the films of the men, but nobody was looking for Alice Howell's films or Faye Tincher's films. So that's why I decided to write the book because I, I really felt they deserved the attention and uh, you know it needed to be done. Could you say something about Alice Howell and Gail Henry? Who are they? Sure. Well, they were both comedians that were very popular in the teens. They became very popular in the teens. And they were both what I refer to as clowns. They were female clowns. You know, they weren't leading ladies. They were, you know, like the male clowns. You know, they were, they were, they took a lot of punishment. They took a lot of physical punishment. They dressed in funny clothes. Alice Howell was a very attractive woman, but she wore her hair piled high on her head like this huge beehive and she had bee stung lips but she had a funny kind of penguin waddle walk and she wore you know these old baggy clothes and clodhopper shoes well gail henry was a little bit different uh the best way to describe her is she was like the living embodiment of olive oil <laughs> popeye's girlfriend she looked and she may actually have been the model for olive oil because she looked she's a dead ringer for olive oil and, uh, you know, she, what she kind of did was dictated by her looks. You know, she often played spinsters or, you know, and they both played working class girls. They played waitresses and diners or they played uh, chambermaids and things like that, you know. And, but they took a lot of punishment. They took a lot of bumps and bruises. Early in the book, some, um, you have dis discussions of Florence Turner and Florence Lawrence. Florence Turner was known as the Vitagraph Girl. Florence Lawrence was known as the as the Biograph Girl. <coughs> Could you say something about those two um, early movie stars? Was sure. Florence Turner was she the first movie star? Well, you know, it's 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 sort of tough to say exactly who was the first, but they were some of the first movie stars. I mean, there were some others in Europe as well. There were some funny ladies who were appearing in films in Europe, but Florence Turner and Florence Lawrence both started in films around 1907. And Florence Turner was at Vitagraph, so hence she became the Vitagraph girl. And then uh, Florence Lawrence was at Biograph. And they often say that Florence Lawrence was the first movie star. Uh, she kind, kind of gets credit for that, that they they built things around her, but they were both contemporaries and uh, they were both uh, funny women. Florence Turner in particular, it's really sad that she's very forgotten and a lot of her films are missing because she was a great mimic. Uh, she used to do a stage show where she would mimic people like Ford Sterling and Larry Seaman and, and you see the photos and it's amazing. She looks just like them. And she would do character studies as well. So she had this knack for creating these funny characters. Um, so it's really a shame that she, you know, that she isn't better known and that so many of her films are missing. But she worked at Vitagraph until about 1913. And then she went to England because she became such a big star. She went to England and set up her own company in England, Turner Films. And she was making features over there 
and she did some good work, but um, they had a lot of problems because of World War One, you know, so production was disrupted and, and eventually she had to come back to the States and she ended up doing a lot of character and supporting roles, but it's like her, her starring moment had passed, you know, when she came back, so. Um, and one of the figures that, that is in your book um, prominently is Mabel Norman. Ah, I think we have a picture of Mabel, I think, right? With yes. The Dean's gonna put up for us. Ah, here we go. Yeah, here's Mabel and she's with her frequent co-star Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Uh, they did a number of films. They were actually a team uh, in 1950 and there's a lot of Fatty and Mabel films. Uh, probably the most famous is Fatty, Fatty and Mabel Adrift. Uh, but Mabel, you know, Mabel was a clown, but she was also a leading lady. She was both, you know, because she was really beautiful. She had great beauty, but she wasn't afraid to kind of roll up her sleeves and get into the physical comedy like the men. You know, you see that in some of the films she did with Chaplin in 1914. And in a lot of the films with Arbuckle, they do a lot of knockabout. So while she could be the leading lady, she, could, she was also a slapstick comic. Was she the first woman slapstick comedy director? I think so, yes, uh, because I think it was in 1913 that Senate gave her the opportunity to start, you know, start directing her own pictures because uh, Senate was busy. He was sort of busy behind the scenes running the whole studio. So he kind of stopped performing and he, and he stopped doing being the hands-on director. So he gave Mabel the opportunity. She was first, then he gave the opportunity to Ford Sterling to direct his own pictures. Same thing with Arbuckle. You know, he eventually let his biggest stars take over. But she directed for about a year, a year and a half, a number of films. Unfortunately, a lot of the ones she directed are missing. Uh, it's funny because years later in the 1920s, somebody asked her, you know, said you were one of the first women directors and she kind of poo-pooed it she said oh well what we did then you really can't call it direction you know compared to today so she she was being very modest uh you know because she uh she she had a knack for it there was a film molly O. uh-huh one of her features one of her features is that considered one of the, her best features yeah, that's considered very good. Another one that's considered of her surviving films, another one that's considered very good is Mickey, uh, which she did, both of those she did for Max Sennett. Um, tell, tell who Max Sennett is to those who may not know who Max Sennett was. Well, Max Sennett is sort of the Henry Ford of silent comedy. You know, he created the first slapstick studio so it's like an assembly line, like Henry Ford's assembly line making autos. Max Sennett had an assembly line to make comedy shorts. And uh, he had been, I think he grew up in Connecticut, but he came to New York. He wanted to be an opera singer, but he ended up in musical theater shows. He worked on Broadway a few times, like in the chorus of shows. And uh, he got involved in early pictures, I think around 1908. He started working at Biograph under D.W. Griffith. He became part of the company. And he also wrote scripts. Uh, an early script that he wrote and that Griffith directed was The Curtain Pole, which is pretty well known. Um, and said it was very influenced by the European comedies that he saw that always had a lot of chases, a lot of the French comedies and Italian comedies. So he loved those. And they often had funny cops in these European films. So he got the idea for a group of comedy cops and he first started directing at Biograph. He worked his way up to becoming head of their comedy unit. And then in 1912, he was able to set up his own company, the Keystone Film Company. And that's when he started uh, doing the Keystone Cops and eventually he got the idea of the Bathing Beauties. That actually came from Mabel because he had her in films at the beach in the bathing suit and I think he just, he realized that if one woman in the bathing suit creates a sensation, you put a whole group together, you've really got something. And they did, you know, people still talk about the Max Senate bathing beauties. 
and it became a staple where, you know, all these other comedy companies would have to have their own bathing girls. There were the Fox Sunshine Girls, there were the LKO Beauties, you know, they had their own, and they had their own cops too, because these were so popular, you know. Wow. Senate was really, you know, his title is the king of comedy, and he was in the teens and 20s. Was there, there were a couple um, murders that when I was reading about um, Mabel Norman, the murder of William Desmond Taylor. Yes. And, and, and then one of Cortland Dines. Yeah, Mabel, unfortunately, the latter part of career, like her good friend Roscoe Arbuckle, unfortunately, they both had scandals, you know, that interrupted their careers. Um, Mabel was very close to the director, William Desmond Taylor, and he was a director at Paramount Pictures, and he was murdered in, well, now I'm blanking on that, can't remember the year, I think it was around 1920, yeah, 1921, he was murdered. And it's never really been solved. But Mabel, you know, unfortunately, she wasn't involved in the murder, but she was kind of tarred by association. And uh, so that hurt her career. And then the, if that wasn't bad enough, then this incident with Cortland Dines, he actually wasn't killed, but he was shot. And it seems like he was shot by Mabel's chauffeur. Um, and it's all very vague exactly what happened. But uh, again, that was like a second scandal, which didn't do her career uh, any good. Um, what, is, what was um, um, Mabel Norman's um, uh, most, most admired film or most admired um, film, films? That well, I think, I think her probably her most admired film was Mickey. That was her first feature and it came out in 1918, but they shot it earlier in 1916. Uh, it sat on the shelf for two years, but Senate finally got it released and it was a major hit. It was huge and it ran forever. But unfortunately, by the time that Mickey came out, she had left Senate, the Senate studio and was making films for Samuel Goldwyn. Uh, but Mickey really was the biggest of her films. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, what was the plot of that film? Uh, she's a girl, she lives, uh, she, her stepfather is a miner. So they live out in the woods in a cabin and she has a, uh, a nursemaid who's a Native American, who was a real Native American actress named Princess Minnie, who was a good friend of Mabel's. <laughs> and so she's kind of a, I don't want to say a free spirit, but you know, kind of a wild girl. She lives with her dog and you know, she gets into trouble, which she doesn't mean to. And uh, she meets a surveyor who comes out there and you know, they start a romance. And uh, the miner decides because she gets into so much trouble that she needs to go live with relatives in the city. You know, she needs to be civilized. You know, she needs to, to have the proper schooling and the proper, so, uh, he takes her and leaves her with the relatives. And then, of course, it turns out that she inherits a fortune because uh, the relatives don't treat her very well. But uh, she has a lot of ups and downs, but then, of course, it all works out at the end. Do you have a favorite Alice Howell film? <laughs> yeah, I think my favorite Alice Howell film is, uh, is a film called uh, Distilled Love. And uh, Ben Modell and I actually put out an Alice Howell DVD uh, called the Alice Howell Collection of some of her, her best surviving films. And Distilled Love is on there. It's great. Uh, she has support from Oliver Hardy, who's in it, you know, before Laurel and Hardy. So that's a, that's a really good one. That's, and it, it's funny to talk about Alice Howell because her daughter, uh, Yvonne Howell, married a guy named George Stevens who at the time was a, was a cinematographer, but he became a director. And he's one of the big Hollywood directors. He directed uh, A Place in the Sun, Shane, I Remember Mama. So Alice Howell's grandson is George Stevens Jr., who is head of the American Film Institute. So she's the first generation of a, you know, a major Hollywood family. 
So, uh, and she, uh, all the money she made, she put into California real estate and she made a fortune. That's amazing. So, and you had said, you asked why Alice Howell and Gail Henry hadn't been better known. Can you say something a little bit more about what, who Gail Henry was? Yeah, well, Gail Henry, you know, was, uh, she had been on stage uh, doing some comic opera and things. And she got involved, uh, started in pictures in 1914 at Universal. They had a series that was sort of a rival series to Senate's Keystone uh, that they called Joker comedies. And <clears throat> Gail was in that with a guy named Max Asher and Milburn Morante, another guy named Billy Franey. So they turned out these little one reelers and they made like one a week. And she became very popular in these films. And uh, by 1919, she had her own production company. Wow. So she was making, she, she, she didn't direct, but you know, she was part of the producing these comedies, her own comedies. So she did that for a couple of years, uh, but then she ended up becoming a supporting player and did very well as support and features. Uh, and she supported Charlie Chase. She worked with him a number of times. Wow. But she retired in the early 30s because she and her husband, Henry East, uh, they had a dog named Buddy who appeared a lot with Charlie Chase. And Buddy got them started in the dog training business. And in the early 1930s, their dog Skippy became better known as Asta. Ah. Uh. Wow. So Yeah, so he was the dog in the Thin Man series, and he was also in The Awful Truth and Bringing Up Baby. So she and her husband opened a big kennel, and they supplied dogs to movies for years. That's great. That's great. Another major figure in your book is Marie Dressler. Ah. Um, yeah. And she debuted in Tilly's Punctured Romance. Yep, that was her film. Uh, debut, but of course she was a big stage star. Big you know, at the turn of the 20th century, she was one of the biggest stars on 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 the New York stage. Um, and uh, people, you know, they wanted her advice on this and that. I mean, really, she was she was so popular. And then she had a big hit in a show called Tilly's Nightmare. And uh, she plays a kitchen maid who wants to go to this big show but she can't go. She has to stay in the kitchen and then she falls asleep and then dreams her own show. Um, so Max Sennett took sort of the idea of Tilly and, you know, they fashioned Tilly's punctured romance for Marie Dressler and they co-starred her with Charlie Chaplin and Mabel Norman. Wow. And did, did um, Charlie Chaplin um, get his start by one of these um, from one of any of these <laughs> silent um, silence. Yeah, well, he got his start with Max Sennett. That's it. He had been in the English Music Hall uh, with a company called Fred Carno's Speechless Comedians, and they toured the United States. They would come over here and, and tour in vaudeville. And uh, the story is that Max Sennett and Mabel Norman saw the Carno show and saw Chaplin. And at the time, they needed someone. So Max Sennett wired the company and said, is there somebody named Chapman in your company or something? And uh, they set it up. So he came and started working at Keystone in the beginning of 1914. Wow. Um, and, no, go ahead, Luke. Oh, go ahead. yeah. Um, um, could, um, could we get maybe another photo? Uh, sure. The next photo, whatever the, is the next one. Ah, well, okay. that's that's Louise Fazenda. And she was famous for her curly hair, curls hair. Yeah, she played a country girl. She always played like a country girl that people like Charlie Murray or Ford Sterling would try and take advantage of. And with her is Pepper the Cat. Pepper the Cat. Yeah, she's in, she's in the book Slapstick Divas because uh, she was uh, one of Max Sennett's movie stars. Uh, he had two animals, uh, Pepper the Cat, and Teddy, the Great Dane, who starred in the movie Teddy at the Throttle and a number of things. But uh, Luis Fazenda and Pepper appeared together pretty often. But Fazenda, she was a great comedian. Again, she was, you know, kind of a clown because she took, she did stunts and falls 
you know, like the guys. She took a lot of bumps and bruises, but she was an excellent actress and she always played her parts very seriously, uh, which made them funnier. But she in the 20s became a character actress and she worked until 1939. She's in a lot of sound films uh, as, as a supporting player. She married the producer Hal Wallace, who produced movies for years. He produced most of the Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis movies. And uh, in Hollywood, he was known as the prisoner of Fazenda, you know, because they were married. But uh, somebody thought that was funny. Uh, but but uh, so, yeah, that's Louise Fazenda. Great. How about the next? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, there's Gail Henry. Okay. So you can see, you know, how much she looks like olive oil. Yes. And she was, you know, extremely skinny. Her billing in her shorts was the elongated comedian. You know, <laughs> she was tall and skinny. And she wore these big hats that looked like satellite dishes on her head. You know, she wore these big hats with skimpy flowers on top. And she wore, you know, odd mismatching clothing. And she was always playing spinsters or country girls kind of thing. Oh, and this is Billy Rhodes. Now, you know, we had talked about the clowns, but Billy Rhodes was more of a leading lady. And she was in sort of a little more sophisticated situational comedies. And she worked a lot for producer Al Christie, who kind of specialized in a little more situational comedy. There was still some slapstick but uh, it was more situational. And again, she, she had a strong resemblance to Mabel Norman, uh, but she's a very funny, funny comedian. Ah, now of course we had the, the actual funny ladies, but there were a number of men who kind of got into the act and appeared in drag and uh, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle spent a lot of time in drag and he was particularly convincing. Uh, in drag and he, he, he did films, he did films where it's, he's a male character who's supposed to be in drag for a reason, you know, to hide from the police or something. But he also did films where he was really playing a female character. Uh, John Bunny also played uh, in drag quite a bit. And Wallace Beery, who people know from the films he did, you know, for MGM in the 30s, started his film career uh, as a character called Sweetie, where he played a big lummox Swedish girl in drag. Uh, so, uh, so Arbuckle, I've seen a photo of Arbuckle with his sister, his older sister, and he, his sister looked just like him in drag. So he's very convincing. This is another of the clowns. This is an actress named Ethel Tear, and she was a little bit <laughs> excuse me, similar to uh, Louise Vizenda, because she played a lot of country girls and she has kind of the buns on either side of her head, almost look like horns, uh, but she was very popular. Uh, she's very forgotten, unfortunately, but her big heyday were the, were the late teens and the early 20s. I don't know what she's doing in this photo. She's got this limp cat that she's threatening uh, Tom Kennedy with, but, uh, but that's Ethel Tear. Ah, and the, there were other leading ladies who really weren't funny, but they supported comedians like Harold Lloyd or, so Mildred Davis was uh, Harold, Lloyd leading, Harold Lloyd's leading lady for a number of years. They actually married. Uh, and then Jobina Ralston took over and became Harold Lloyd's leading lady. But Charlie Chaplin had Edna Purviance for a number of years, who was his leading lady. Buster Keaton had different leading ladies. In his shorts, he had uh, Virginia Fox and another actress named Sybil Seeley. But, but these women, you know, sort of their role was to support the comedian and, you know, create a kind of a love interest to keep the plot going, especially for the features. And for those who, who don't know who Harold Lloyd is, I'm sure that, that everyone knows him. He's most famous for hanging on an outside clock over a That's screen. right. In safety last. In but safety last. Image, even if people don't know the films or know who Harold Lloyd is, people usually know that image of him hanging from the clock. Yeah, in, indeed, indeed. Um, 
Okay, ah. what do we got next? Well, this is Edna Marion. And she was, again, she was kind of a leading lady, but she would do slapstick. Uh, she had her own series for century comedies. These were distributed by Universal, and she's very popular, but she went to the Hal Roach studio, and this is how people usually know her today, but she was support to Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chase. Uh, unfortunately, Hal Roach never starred her in her own comedies, but she's, she's always great when she turns up in support. And this is from one of her starring films called Powdered Chickens. I think it's from 1925. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah, now this is this is actually one of my favorites. This is Martha Sleeper. And she was a comedian. She's very well known from the things she did for Hal Roach. She worked with Charlie Chase. She played Max Davidson's daughter in a lot of films. And she was a wonderful comedian. She was just, just the greatest. Um, very, very funny. Um, later, she left Roach. And she started working in features, but they put her in dramatic features, which really didn't capitalize on her real strengths. And she got fed up with Hollywood and came to New York and appeared for 10 years. She appeared in various Broadway shows, but none of them ran very long. She even did one with Spencer Tracy, where he came back to New York. I think it was something called The Rugged Path. But again, it didn't run very long. But uh, she's a wonderful comedian. And there's a lot of her films that are available uh, that you can find. A lot of the Charlie Chase things. I think that's the last picture. Okay. Could you say who Polly Moran was? Oh, yeah, definitely. No, Polly Moran, she was one of the clowns. She was a real knockabout comedian. And she had been a vaudeville star. She was big on vaudeville. Uh, she sang, she did comedy songs. Uh, you know, she was the type that said, you know, her voice wasn't good, but it was good and loud, that kind of thing, you know. And she made fun of herself, saying how, you know, she was, uh, she was kind of chubby, you know, she was kind of overweight, but she dressed in dowdy clothing. And uh, so she toured the world in vaudeville. She was very popular. But then she started uh, working for Max Sennett around 1915. And she's usually playing like janitor's wives and things like that. She would be teamed with Charlie Murray. Uh, and then they developed a character for her called Sheriff Nell, where she was kind of a wild and woolly Western sheriff. You know, she's got six guns and she's taking the male role. And she did that for a while. And then she went back to the stage. But in the later 20s, she came back in features and she was often teamed with Marie Dressler. They were teamed together and they made a lot of sound shorts together for MGM where they're, where they're a team. And it's usually Polly, her scatterbrain schemes get Marie into trouble and Marie has to try and get them out of the trouble. Uh, but she was very popular. And Pearl White was, is a name some people might recognize. Pearl White. Pearl White is a name that people are going to know, but they pretty much know her from being the serial queen you know, the perils of Pauline and things like that. But before she did Perils of Pauline, she starred in a series of crystal comedies. That was the name of the series. And they were made here in New York. <coughs> and they were, little, they were a little more situational. Uh, but she starred with a guy named Chester Barnett and they made a couple of years of these. these and the, uh, the films that survived are pretty good. They're pretty funny. Uh, but She's remembered as a serial queen, not, you know, for what she, she did in these comedies. And how about Lillian Walker? Lillian Walker, she was a leading lady and she worked for the Vitagraph Company in Brooklyn. And that's where Florence Turner had become a star at Vitagraph. And Lillian Walker was very pretty. She was very pretty blonde and she had two dimples when she smiled. And that was her nickname. Her, her screen name became Dimples. <laughs> she was known as, but she did some comedy. She worked a lot with John Bunny. She would play his daughter or his niece and that kind of thing. And then eventually she was doing her own comedies. <coughs> and eventually she, be, she ended up doing features for a while. Norma Talmadge, was there two Talmadges? Yeah, there were two Talmadges. They were sisters. There was Norma Talmadge and there was Constance Talmadge. 
There was a third sister as well, Natalie Talmadge, who really wasn't an actress, but she married Buster Keaton. She was Buster Keaton's first wife. But of the two Talmadge girls, uh, Norma was the dramatic diva. She was one of the big dramatic stars of the 1920s. But Constance was the comedienne. <coughs> and originally, she was the younger sister. Norma started working at Vitagraph uh, in the early teens. And Nor uh, Constance kind of came along and uh, was kind of funny. So they started putting her in the films. And then she became a lead comedienne. A lot of her feature films were written by Anita Luz uh, in the early 20s. Uh, it's sad because Constant Talmadge was very funny, but a lot of her features are missing. How about Virginia Baby Daniels? Oh, Virginia. Yeah, Baby Daniels. She, uh, she was like born in a trunk. Her parents were performers on the stage. So she started performing as a child, but she hit pictures uh, by being Harold Lloyd's leading lady. So she started working with Harold like in 1915. I think she was 15 years old. She was very young and she stayed with Harold, worked with him until 1919, being his leading lady. And then she went off and uh, started doing features. She worked for Cecil B. DeMille, was in some of his <coughs> features. But then in the 1920s, she became a big star for Paramount and starred in her own feature comedies. Uh, again, sadly, a lot of those are missing, uh, but she was very popular uh, in, the, in the late 1920s. Did Myrna Loy, Jean Harlow, or Carol Lombard, did they do any silent, silent film comedy? They did. They were all, they all got their start in silent film. Uh, Carol Lombard even worked for Max Sennett. She was in some of these, what they called Senate girl comedies, like 1927 and 1928. And some of the other people got more of the laughs and they left it to Carol to kind of carry the beauty part. But she did get laughs and Myrna Loy did as well. Uh, so they all, they started and of course then they became big stars uh, in sound. And Jean Harlow as well? Jean Harlow as well, yeah. She, uh, she was working at the Hal Roach studio. She did a famous bit with Laurel and Hardy in a film called Double Whoopi uh, where she gets out of a taxi cab and Stan and Ollie are like the doorman and the footman in front of the hotel. So she gets out of the taxi and Stan closes the door on the train of her dress. So when, when Ollie escorts her into the hotel, it pulls off her dress. So she's got her slip on when they, you know. So that's kind of a famous thing she did with Laurel and Hardy. But then in 1930, she uh, had a big part in the film Hell's Angels. And that kind of set her you know, she became a big star at MGM. Wow. Um, Edna Perviance, uh -huh. Mildred Davis, Jabina Ralston. You got Lloyd and you have Chaplin connections. Yeah, well, those are the, the women that we did talk about in the photos that were the leading ladies for the comedians. You know, they were always very pretty and they were always, they were, they were good. They were very pleasant and, and they had charming personalities, but they never got the opportunity to really be funny because they were supporting the male comics. So it was sort of up to them to be funny, but they were, uh, you know, sort of the support. And usually with the features, it was always a plot point, especially with Harold Lloyd, because he's, he's trying to make good to win the girl, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And what about Anita Garvin and Marion Byron. Ah, Marion Byron, yes, and Anita Garvin. Well, they were one of their, in silent comedy, there weren't that many female comedy teams. There were tons of male comedy teams. I mean, Laurel and Hardy, we all know, but there was Eddie Lyons and Lee Moran. There was Wallace Beery and Raymond Hatton. There are tons of male comedians, but very few female comedians. Marie Dressler and Polly Moran made a, a couple of features, but Hal Roach paired Anita Garvin and Marion Byron. And he kind of, you know, Laurel and Hardy had become popular and Laurel and Hardy were, you know, known as fat and skinny. So what he did with Anita Garvin and Marion Byron, he had tall and small. Because uh -huh. Anita was very tall and leggy and Marion was little and cute. So they, he put them together and they only made three films together. Uh, but the last one, A Pair of Tights, 
is a real classic. It's a, it's a really a wonderful film. So it's too bad they didn't do more, uh, but they were they were really great together. And what about Zazu Pitts? Ah, Zazu Pitts, yes. She started in films in the teens, uh, playing smaller parts. She worked with Mary Pickford a couple of times. Um, she, she was, you know, the kind of thought of as an eccentric, you know, playing these kind of eccentric characters with her hand gestures. But of course it turned out she was a great dramatic actress because Eric von Stroheim used her as a lead in Greed and in The Wedding March. Uh, so she really was a great actress, but she really made her mark in comedies. Uh, and, you know, she continued working up till around 1960. You know, because she, she appeared in all kinds of talkie films. She appeared on television with Gail Storm. And uh, so she worked for years. Did any, which stars um, made it into the sound era um, with, with equal um, achievement? Um, hmm. uh, B.B. Daniels made the transition very well to sound. In fact, her first sound film was a musical, Rio Rita, where she appeared with Wheeler and Woolsey, but she sang and danced and uh, she did a wide variety of things. She did the Rio Rita, she did another, the Cuckoos, um, but then she did uh, some dramas and comedies. So she, you know, she did very well. A lot of the other silent ladies, I mean, Jean Harlow became a big star and Myrna Loy, uh, but some of the bigger stars, uh, people like Laura LaPlante, who was a big uh, star for Universal, a lot of them, they did some early talkies, but then they ended up kind of retiring, uh, you know, and didn't go on for a long time. Clara Bow, she oh, had puckish humor and spontaneity. Yes, Clara Bow. Well, she was known as the It Girl. The you know, it Girl. Her, her famous film was It, uh, which is directed by Clarence Badger. And Clara was a great comedian. She's very funny. But she was a great actress. And, and the peak of her popularity was in the late 1920s. Uh, in, 30, in the 30s, she didn't do as well. She ended up retiring by about 1934. Uh, but... Uh, while she, unfortunately, a lot of her films are missing, but the ones that, that do survive uh, show her to be, you know, really great talent. Were women, had openings for women's work as screenwriters? Yeah, it's funny because uh, in the early days, there were more women directors. There was Alice Guy Blanchet, uh, there was Lois Weber, but as the men kind of came in and took over the industry, especially when the, with the rise of the studios. But there was still a lot of opportunity for women as screenwriters. Frances Marion was a very famous uh, woman screenwriter. Anita Luz was another one. Um, and they worked for years. They worked into the sound era. <coughs> and women also became editors. There were a lot of women film editors like Margaret Booth. And there were, there were many of them too. Uh, so behind the scenes, there were a lot of opportunities for women. Um, yeah. Um, the Marion Davies. Yes. I think you praise her in the book as having talent. She's talented. She was. You know, she gets kind of a raw deal uh, from history. And part of it is due to Orson Welles and Citizen Kane, because everybody knows that Citizen Kane was sort of based on William Randolph Hearst, who was Marion Davies' lover. She actually was his mistress for many years, and he produced her films starting in around 1917. But Davies, she had been a chorus girl on Broadway and worked her way up to, you know, little featured roles. And then that's where uh, Hearst saw her on stage and she became, you know, they became associated and he started producing films, but she was very talented and she's a wonderful comedian. And uh, the Hearst liked to put her in dramatic historical dramas, but her best films that survive are her comedies like Show People, The Patsy, The Cardboard Lover. She was a wonderful mimic. She was a wicked mimic. You see things like The Patsy, she imitates 
uh, Lillian Gish and Paula Negri and Mae Murray. <coughs> and she, she puts on uh, scarves and hats to do it, but she transforms into them in front of your eyes. It's really amazing. And she does Gloria Swanson in, in show people. So she not only, she, she could physically mimic these people. It's really amazing. She was a great mimic and she was a, a wonderful comedian. So she kind of, um, she gets a little overlooked, but I have to say, it's really great that Turner Classic Movies has shown a lot of the Marion Davies films and have done a lot to sort of booster her reputation. The people, if people can see her films, then, you know, they'll really see what a great comedian she was. And how about Hazel Dean and Doris Dean? Well, they were sisters. Okay. And they, they had been in vaudeville together. I think they did some kind of musical comedy act. And they, they both ended up working for Max Sennett in the teens. And they never really became very well known. You know, they were always kind of supporting players. Uh, but they, you know, these people are very important because they make up the fabric of the silent comedy universe. And uh, right. uh, most of these people appeared and they're always, you know, they always get their laughs. They always do what they're supposed to do. They're always real professionals. And you see these people over and over. Yeah, yeah. So. And Olive Thomas and Betty Thompson. Well, Olive Thomas had been a Ziegfeld girl. Uh, she was really well known uh, for being a Ziegfeld girl. And then she went into films and uh, unfortunately, she's best remembered today for her death. Uh, she was married to Jack Pickford, who was Mary Pickford's brother, and they were in Paris. And uh, I think she went, the story is she went to the restroom and they had come in late and she went to the restroom to take a sedative or something. And she drank bichloride of mercury by accident. And uh, yeah, so she's unfortunately remembered for that. Um, not many of her films survive, but there's one called The Flapper, which is really marvelous. And it was written by Frances Marion and shows her off very well. Betty Compson, uh, again, she uh, came from vaudeville and she started working in Christie comedies. She was kind of a leading lady in Christie's, but then she made the jump to features and she became a movie star. And she made a lot of films in the 20s. Uh, some of them do exist like... Uh, there's a Joseph von Sternberg film that she stars in, The Docks of New York, which is really great. So she was married to the director, James Cruz. And uh, she worked into the early sound era, but then she, she well, I think she actually worked into the 1940s, but then she retired from pictures and had other businesses. Um, Roscoe Arbuckle, did he have, did he, did he act opposite many, many of these women? Um, um... Well, he did. Yeah. You know, we talked uh, about him working with Mabel Norman because they were really a team. Probably the most famous is Fatty and Mabel Adrift, but they did a number of pictures together. Uh, Roscoe also worked with his wife, Minta Durfee, who was a, a really kind of great character comedian. She's very funny and she worked at Senate from about 1914 through 1917. So she worked a lot with Roscoe. Um, and also while we're talking about Roscoe, I have a shameless plug for my most recent book, Rediscovering Roscoe, the films of Fatty Arbuckle. And as you can see, it's pretty hefty like Roscoe himself. So <laughs> it, it goes film by film because there, there hasn't, there hadn't been a book, you know, really all the books on Arbuckle pretty much talk about the scandal you know, the Labor Day scandal that happened in 1921. <coughs> and so this is really the first book to focus on the films and go film by film and talk about the films that exist and try and gather as much information on the ones that are still missing. Um, so that's my plug for uh, rediscovering Roscoe. That's great. Um, um, how did you, did, did you go to different archives to get information on? on I on did. I, I'm, I, I'm lucky, and, and for Slapstick Divas, too, and yeah. my other books. I'm lucky because I work at a major archive. I work for the 
New York Public Library for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. So I have all their film periodicals and, and photos and clipping files at my fingertips. But I, I did go to, you know, I got a lot of material from the Museum of Modern Art, a lot of photographs, looked at a lot of the films in their archive. Uh, same thing at Library of Congress, looked at a lot of their films and was able to use their archives and also uh, the archives around the world. Um, you know, I've been able to look at a number of the films that way, which has really been helpful. So your book on Arbuckle then will turn away, it'll turn away from the, 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 the topic that everyone talks about, which is his, the scandal, his trials, which yeah. of, of which he I, was I mean, acquitted, which, which I, he was acquitted. Yeah, he was acquitted um, after three trials. You're um, looking at, at what he achieved filmographically. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it's, you know, trying to talk about why we should still care about him, why we should watch the films, you know, what his talents were uh, as a comedian, as a director, as a comedy creator. And nobody really dealt with that. You know, they really just, it's the it was the first big celebrity scandal. So that's what everybody in the books that were written, that was the main event. And his they'll cover his career before a little bit, but his career after, they'd almost dismiss. So I really wanted to take the time and, and really show and discuss the work. That's good. And how, how productive was he in terms of films? That, that, that's, it looks like a, a large book. There's gotta he be- He was productive. He made about 240 films. <laughs> um, most of them were shorts, you know, so he cranked out a lot of shorts uh, in the early days for Senate and then after the scandal, he couldn't appear on screen, so he directed shorts. He directed shorts with people like Al St. John and Lupino Lane and Lloyd Hamilton. He directed two features, The Red Mill with Marion Davies and uh, Special Delivery with Eddie Cantor. And then in the early sound era, he directed a lot of shorts. And then in 1932, he finally got the chance to appear on screen again, and he did six shorts for Warner Brothers Vitaphone. Uh, and made his comeback, but then unfortunately he passed away uh, just as he finished those films. Wow. Um, did, he, did he work with Keaton? Yes. Uh, Arbuckle brought Keaton into films. Uh, the Buster's first film was in 1917, The Butcher Boy. And that was Arbuckle's first independent short. He had left Max Sennett and set up his own company. So the story goes that uh, Arbuckle and Keaton met on the street through a mutual friend, a guy named Lou Anger, who was with Arbuckle, but knew Buster from vaudeville, and they ran into Buster on the street, and Anger introduced them, and they both knew who each other were. Wow. And Arbuckle said, hey, I'm starting my first film tomorrow. Have you ever been in films? Would you like to come out, Buster, and do a bit in the film? And Buster said yes, and that was the beginning. Wow. All right, thank you, uh, Gary and Steve. This has been, uh, I know you guys can keep talking for hours, <laughs> but uh, we have quite a few questions from the audience. Oh, great. So perhaps we can tackle a few of those if you're up for it. Sure. The first one um, <laughs> is when is uh, Rediscovering Roscoe going to be released? Looks like a fun Christmas present as the what? Slapstick Divas. Oh. Okay, well, it is published. Uh, it came out at Christmas time of uh, this past Christmas. <clears throat> so it is available on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. Uh, it's through the publisher Bear Manor Media, but it is available and it I, I, I'm happy that you think it would make a great Christmas present. That's great. I'm gonna get it for uh, my, under my uh, Christmas tree. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> Um, here's a question from uh, Robert, who I believe is joining us from Poland, which I oh. think it's like either 1 or 2 a.m. there right now. Oh, I know, Robert. So uh, Robert would like to know, did some female comedians come closer in popularity to male comedians in their time? I think the two female comedians that came the closest to the success of the male comedians were Mabel Norman and Marie Dressler. Uh, some of the others like B.B. Daniels, 
Laura LaPlante, they were starring in features for big studios like Paramount or Universal, and their films did well. So, you know, they were highly regarded stars. Uh, but I think it was really Marie Dressler and Mabel Norman that, that had the closest success to the male comics. Great. Um, this is a question from Naomi. I believe we have quite the, the large European audience. Mm. Um, Naomi would like to know, has anyone written a similar account of the European divas of the silent era? That's a great question because that's a book that really needs to be written. Uh, in Slapstick Divas, I do talk about uh, a number of these, uh, the European comedians, uh, Sarah Dumal, uh, Jagetta Moreno. They were very early in the early teens. Uh, there were a number of these women and a no, you know, many of their films survive and they're, and they're really wonderful. And even later, uh, there was a German actress named Ossie Oswalda who was in some of the early features that were directed by Ernst Lubitsch, uh, one where she's in drag pretending to be a boy. Um, there was also Betty Balfour, who was a British comedian who made a number of films. So I do try to cover, um, you know, a number of, of the European ladies, but they really deserve their own book. You know, they really do because uh, they were really excellent. I couldn't agree more. Um, a question from Nancy. Uh, were there any black silent comedians? So either male or female, I suppose. There were, there were a number of black performers in silent films, uh, and you'll see them in the films today. Unfortunately, the, they usually, you know, kind of stereotypical roles where they're somebody's broke, um, chauffeur and they're scared, you know, they have to go on a haunted house with the comedian and the, the black characters are scared or, you know, it's, uh, some of them are very funny comedians, but they had to deal with very stereotypical uh, material. Um, as far as real stars, there were two, though, uh, but they were children. Uh, Sunshine Sammy Morrison and uh, Alan Farina Hoskins. And they both were at the Hal Roach studio. Sunshine Sammy had worked with uh, Snub Pollard and Harold Lloyd. And, Harold, and Hal Roach, the producer, got the idea to create our gang because he had uh, Ernie Morrison under contract. So he had Ernie and he surrounded him with, the, uh, with other kids and that became our gang. It was known on television as a little rascal. And Farina was part of that group as well. And they were both wildly popular. Um, but it, it, you know, it's kind of indicative of what was going on in our society at that time, that the only two real black silent comedy stars were children, because um, they weren't threatening, you know, to uh, white society. Great. Um, this is a question from Rich, who is joining us from San Antonio. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> please discuss any descendants, later comedians, who may have been influenced by any of these performers, either the grotesques or the light comedians? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I very much like to follow how comedy and, and how it gets passed down as far as a tradition. Um, I'm trying to think, um, you know, in the 30s, what really became popular were the screwball comedies. So you had people like Gene Harlow, you had Irene Dunn was in a number of, of the, um, and Carol Lombard, <coughs> excuse me, and Carol Lombard, as we mentioned earlier, got her start in slapstick comedy working for Max Sennett. Um, I think Martha Ray is someone, you know, who is very popular in films in the late 30s and 1940s, and then on television in the 50s and, and of course beyond. I think she was very influenced by people like Marie Dressler and Polly Moran, uh, the very physical clown type of, of comedians. Um, I'm sure there, there's many more, of course, that I can't think of right now, but uh, I think, you know, there is those traditions really good. And, and Melissa McCarthy, you look at Melissa McCarthy today, a lot of the work 
she she's done is very physically oriented. So she, you know, she she's part of that tradition as well. Right. Um, a question from Morelli. Let's see if you can help her or mm. him. Uh, which film is it that has a scene with Louise uh, Fazenda, Fazenda, uh -huh, Fazenda in drag playing a flirtatious male? She was amazing in it, but I'm having trouble remembering the name of it. I think the film that you're thinking of is called Hearts and Flowers. It's a 1919 Max Sennett comedy. Louise Fazenda is in it, but the drag is done by Phyllis Haver. Um, and she poses as, as a man and she flirts with the other women. <coughs> uh, so I think, I think that's the film, Hearts and Flowers. That's, that sounds great. <laughs> um, another question from Nancy. Has anyone identified the tall, skinny actress who appears with Buster Keaton in The Blacksmith? No. <laughs> I wish they had. She looks like kind of a Gail Henry type. And for a while, people thought it was Gail Henry. But um, she, no, she hasn't, uh, she hasn't been identified as yet. Um, there is somebody who would like you to plug, um, uh, get a plug-in for Sunday's Three Pin Asylum Watch program on YouTube. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, Ben Mael and I do uh, every Sunday at 3 p.m. New York time. Uh, we have a show that we've been doing, uh, the Silent Comedy Watch Party. And we started this, uh, this Sunday, it'll be episode 35. We, sh we started it, uh, because basically Ben and I, all our live shows closed. You know, we couldn't do our live screenings anymore. And we wanted to keep in contact with our audiences. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I swallowed wrong. Excuse me. But we also, during a time like this, people need laughs. They need the distraction. So we wanted to get these comedy films out for people so they can get a good laugh. So We've been doing it, like I said, it's been 35 weeks and it's every Sunday, uh, 3 p.m. And they're archived on YouTube. So, you know, for in certain countries, it's the middle of the night so people can watch them later. But uh, we've been doing this and we plan to continue uh, for the foreseeable future to just keep doing this every week. Uh, and, you know, everybody needs a good laugh. So uh, we show, Either three or two will show two two reelers or two one reelers with a two reeler. So it's about an hour and a half worth of comedy uh, that we show every Sunday. That's great. I couldn't agree more that everybody needs a good laugh every once in a while. Um, and especially now. <laughs> for sure. Uh, this is uh, our final question. And then Gary, I'm going to let you close out the okay. evening. Okay. This is a question from Irenka, who wants to know which actress did you put on the cover of your book? Ah, and I can well, pull that up again. Well, the actress on the cover of the book is Alice Howell, who we talked about. You can see her, her big hair, you know, how she piled her hair up. I say it looks like smoke billowing from an active volcano. You know, she's got this wild mop of hair and she often played chambermaids or working class girls. But that's, that's who, and you can see, she's a very attractive woman. She's very beautiful, but she kind of went out of her way to make herself eccentric, you know, for comedy purposes. So that, that's who's on the cover of Slapstick Divas. And she's one of my favorites. Okay. Um, I, I heartily recommend the, um, the Sunday um, silent comedy watch party um, is something that's really worth, worth, um, worth watching. Um, and um, worth reading is your book Slapstick Divas. Um, and you have the new book on Fatty Arbuckle, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Um, I want to thank Steve Massa for, 
for being our guest tonight. I want to thank Nadine Heidinger at the National Arts Club for her terrific assistance and, and skill. And great thanks to her as well for this program. And um, Steve, um, uh, I really um, th want to thank you for giving us your time to talk about si the women of silent film comedy. Well, thank, thank, thank you, Gary, for the opportunity to talk about these women. I, you know, they deserve all the attention they can get. And I also want to thank Nadine for all her help. Um, you know, these people, these women have been overlooked for decades. And the whole purpose of writing the book was at least to try and bring some attention to them. And if people see their names and see their photos, maybe they'll seek out the films and, you know, so they can still continue on. Good. Terrific. Good. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Gary. <laughs>